Amen. All right, you may be seated. Well, good morning, church. Good morning, church. Awesome. It's good to see everybody here. We will be offering counseling to those of you that did not smile or sing during that last song because there must be something wrong inside of your heart. You know, I mean, gosh, that song gets me all worked up. It's like, hey, I lost another one. I'm like, yeah, how are we saying Jesus? You know, so it's just... If you guys can't smile during that, I don't know what's wrong. Maybe you don't know Jesus. I don't know. I'm not saying that. Anyways, if you have your Bibles, let's open them to Acts chapter 28. Man, can you guys believe that we have finished the book of Acts? You know, it's so funny because it took, you know, such a long time in those two years or whatever that we've been doing it. And then this year, it was like on fast forward how quickly we were going through it. But what an awesome blessing it has been to go through the book of Acts. And so we will finish the last chapter Acts chapter 28. And then uh, some people are asking kind of what's the next step. Uh, We will spend, like I always do, a little bit of time in Psalms, a little bit of time in Proverbs. That way we can continue through those books and we won't have to go through them all in one sitting. And so we'll spend maybe one week in Psalms, one week in Proverbs, and then we're going to go into a gospel. We'll be in the uh, book of Matthew. So I'm very, very excited to start that with everybody as well. Pastor Gerald will be back next week, so it'll be an awesome blessing. And um, so just that encouragement that, man, I'm excited to see what the Lord is doing at Joshua Springs. Are you guys excited? The Lord has been so faithful and so good in so many ways. And man, it is just awesome to ride the wave of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, again, if you're new with us, we're glad you're here. You're already family. And so we want to just kind of tell you what has been going on through the book of Acts and kind of catch you up on the story so you're not completely lost. But what we've been looking at is uh, we saw that Paul had been transferred um, to a boat, basically to appeal to Caesar. He didn't think he was going to get a fair trial. And as a Roman citizen, he was able to say, I appeal to Caesar and let Caesar judge me. And so he was on this boat and this boat is just full of prisoners and sailors and Roman soldiers and, and, and such a different group of people than the people that Paul was used to speaking of when he was in Jerusalem. Um, he, had speaking, he had spoken to people such as governors and kings and commanders and officers and prominent men all through the hard times in which he was experiencing. But now he's loaded on this boat with 276 people. Um, all of them, uh, you know, majority of them were prisoners. And there's two different things that could have been happening with those prisoners. Number one, they They could have been appealing to Caesar just like Paul was to maybe get a fair trial. If they were Roman citizens, they had that right, but most likely not. Most likely they were already sentenced to death and they were on their way to go fight in the Colosseum for their lives. And so Paul, you know, one thing I love about him is he's always left his heart open to serving the Lord in any capacity to wherever and whenever the Lord wanted him to minister. We're going to see that again this morning. Wherever God wanted to send him, God was going to send him. Whatever God wanted to do in his life, he was open to God doing it. Basically, you know, God was kind of like his his secretary feeling these divine appointments within his life. Okay, you just got done speaking to kings and governors and prominent men. Now you're on a boat full of hopeless people. Paul was just a vessel to bring a great message of hope to people that so desperately need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we saw that right off the bat that Paul's character was on display. Do you guys remember Orange Julius? Orange Julius, he was there. Julius, the commander, we, uh, the centurion, we don't know a lot about him except that he... Um, you know, is a hardened Roman because to have that much influence and that much power in Rome, you would have had to have stood out. But we saw that he had kind of this like soft spot for Paul. Now listen, that doesn't come because they saw each other and there was just like a twinkling in each other's eyes like, we're going to be best friends, you know? No, these are two groups of people that usually don't like each other. The Romans and the followers of the way or the Christians, they're not groups that like high five and hang out. What happened was Julius was drawn to the Holy Spirit working in and through Paul. He knew that there was something within Paul's life that he didn't have, and he was drawn to it. And by the end of the story, we see that Julius had such an amazing amount of respect for Paul. It almost looked at the end that like Julius and the other, the Roman guards were like, 
they, were, they, were, they respected Paul so much that they were following whatever Paul told them to do. There was a group of sailors that were trying to save themselves and they were throwing the boats in and Paul looks and says, hey, if they get away, we all go. God said he's gonna save all of us. So if these people leave, it, it, it includes you guys, we're all gonna drown. And so the Roman, the Roman citizens and the Roman, uh, the Roman guard cut the skiffs off, the, 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 the boats break out into the water. And so everyone is together. They trusted, they trusted Paul, but more than trusting Paul, what they didn't realize is they trusted the Lord through Paul. Julius the first time didn't listen to Paul but he wasn't going to make that mistake again. I really do believe that that was just the beginning of an amazing work. Like sure the prisoners needed hope and they needed to to see the Lord at work, but I'm telling you, someone like Julius, I believe that this was a divine divine thing that's happening in Julius's life. And so real long story short, Paul, you know, shared something with them in the midst of this horrible weather storm. This, the waves were tempestuous. They were worried about their lives. And Paul shared something with them in, in chapter 27, verses 21 through 25. He said, men, you should have listened to me. I love that. Men, you should have listened to me. He warned them about not going. He should not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and this loss. And now I urge you to take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only this ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, who said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you and all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe that God, for I believe God that it will happen just as he has told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island." Paul chose to believe God in the midst of a terrifying time. Even when all the signs pointed to opposite, Paul chose to believe what God had told him, that he would be safe. And what was a crazy thing to look at was all the people on the boat could have had that same encouragement if they chose to believe it. The gospel is a great encouragement for those who choose to believe it. And and we ended with everything happening just the same way that, that, that... that Paul explained to him the ship was going to break apart, but all of them were going to survive. And so as the ship began to break apart, the centurion said, those of you that can swim to shore, there was an island. Those of you that can swim to shore, swim to shore. The rest of you grab a piece of this broken boat and float yourself to shore. Again, a supernatural thing's happening there because if a man my size grabs a piece of boat hoping it's going to keep him up, it's not gonna happen, okay? And yet not one person was, was, was killed. Not one person injured. It says they all escaped safely to land. Even though the ship was destroyed, just like the Lord had said, all the people were safe. This whole world, church, is looking for something solid. For years, people have put their efforts into making their bank accounts solid and their stocks solid and their, their, their community and their circle solid. All, people put all this effort into trying to make a foundation for their life. But what we're learning today is everything is on shifting sand. Your finances, the stocks, our country, leadership, it's all shifting sand. But I will tell you that there is one thing that you can set your clocks to, one foundation that you can build your whole life on, and that is the promises of God and the word of God. It will come to pass. If God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And listen, when you choose to believe God over what's happening everywhere else, you're going to draw great encouragement from it. Amen? So this morning, we're going to look at the story as we continue it on, as these people are all shipwrecked on an island. It makes for a great Netflix series. It would have been fantastic. Like, the chosen should t- just do something else and do this, because the island that happens, all the stuff that happens on this island is insane. So we're going to go to the Lord, and then we're going to jump into it. Amen? Lord, you are so faithful, and you are so good to us. Lord, that you would... That you would that you want us to spend time with you is just such an awesome thing. And so, Lord, we're all gathered. I, I pray for the same purpose, Lord, and that's to draw near to you. Maybe there's people here that don't know why they're here. Lord, I just pray that you encourage them that they're not here by accident. Lord, I just pray right now that you would just speak to them and as you would speak to all of us. And for some of us, it's just gonna be encouragement. 
Lord, for some of us, it's just going to be uh, uh, you working in our lives and in our hearts and growing us. And for others, Lord God, man, maybe this is the time where they come to meet you. The first time having an interaction with you where you pulled on their heart and they responded. Lord, we pray for those people. We also pray for the people that need conviction and exhortation. And so, Lord, we give you this whole time to do with it as you will. Lord, we know that without your spirit, we can do nothing. And we know that without your spirit in the service and through the people here, Lord God, it is worth nothing. But Lord, when your spirit is here, Lord God, we expect great things. And so, Lord, that's where we rest all of our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to the Lord and uh, let's not go Lord in prayer. We just did that. I mean, we could do it again, but we're not going to. Uh, verses one through two says, now when they had escaped, they then found out that they were on an island that was called Malta, and the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. Okay, so I, I mentioned that their, their ship had broken apart. They were lost at sea. It says they couldn't see the, 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 the cloud cover was so, they couldn't see the stars. They couldn't see the sun. They didn't know what direction they're in, but now they're shipwrecked and they're figuring out where they're at. They're on an island called Malta, which is about 60 miles south of Sicily. And for any of you that know Italy, it's shaped like a boot, is it not? Follow the toe a little bit out, you'll be, you'll be at Malta. That's where it's at. And, and so we're reading here that there was natives already living on this land and living on the islands. And, and, and they treated these poor, crashed, wet people with an unusual kindness. They weren't afraid of them. They didn't choose to just ignore them and say, well, let them die on the island. No, the natives came and helped them. And what did it say they did? They kindled them a fire. They saw that they were dripping wet. They saw that they needed help. They kindled them a fire. It says they made us feel welcome. I don't know what that means exactly, how you make someone feel welcome, but maybe they brought food. Maybe they helped them. Maybe they taught them things. I don't know, but there's a torrential downpour happening right now, and a nice warm fire is exactly what you need during a torrential downpour, amen? Now, what a great encouragement this would have been for someone like Paul who had just went from jail to a ship that sank to like all these people that are almost on their way to go die. And now they're over here getting rained on and someone just comes over and starts a fire for them and they get treated kindly. What an amazing encouragement that would have been. You know, it was funny when my dad, he, he was, he's like, if you've seen me, you've seen my dad. He was a little bit bigger than me, uh, but my, my dad was, he is a scary looking human being. I am like a cupcake because he raised me right, but he was not raised right. And so he was no cupcake, all right? So my dad looked terrifying. And my dad, when he got diagnosed with his, his cancer, he decided that he was going to do all those things he always wanted to do. And so he drove his Borgette chopper to Sturgis. He uh, decided to go visit his brother in Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, he decided to leave at night. Now, this was before we had cell phones like we have now that you look and you're like, oh, it's going to rain at 3 p.m., you know? And so in the middle of the night, he decides to leave for a four-hour ride. And he begins to go and he gets far enough to where he can't turn around. And he's, he's going and a torrential downpour hits him on a motorcycle. If anyone's ever ridden a motorcycle and you get freezing rain as you're going 65 to 70 miles an hour, not only is it terrifying, but it's also freezing cold. And so my dad got completely soaked. I mean, through and through, completely soaked, was not prepared for the elements and, and just completely soaked. And so he pulled over at a rest stop. And he pulled over at this rest stop and now there's only thing one scarier than having your motorcycle get ready to crash because it's wet. And, and that is to find my father in his whitey tidies inside of a rest stop, drying his clothes over one of the little dryers. Because he's so cold, that's the only thing he could think about doing. And my dad said that there was many people that walked in, they were like, nope, and just walked <laughs> out, you know? You would do the same. You would do the same. Who would have hung out with a six foot six man in his whitey tidies, drying his clothes? You'd be like, there's not amount of bathroom I need to use right now that could get me to go anywhere near that mammoth of a man, right? So he's sitting there drying his clothes and doing his thing. And after about an hour of this, he hears this voice go, Brent? And he turns around in his underwear and it's my uncle, my mom's brother, 
who's also going somewhere totally different and they had not talked to each other. They're at the same rest stop in between Twin Falls and Salt Lake. And my uncle goes, Brent and Mike? And he's like, what are you doing? And he goes, I, uh, my clothes are soaking wet and I'm freezing. I feel like I'm gonna die out there. And he goes, you can just come on in my truck and warm up. And so for like an hour and a half, two hours, they just kept the heater on high and my dad thawed out, it stopped raining and he was able to continue to go. Long story short, my dad was so thankful for just a small act of kindness in a time that he needed it. Even small gestures of kindness go such a long way. If any of you are married in here, Pastor Gerald is like, I hate to tell you guys, but he has set the curve so high, you know, like we all fall short of that when it comes to being awesome. But one thing he's always taught me is small gestures pay off greatly. A note, something. We can all do small things that will receive great, that show great kindness that pay off for us. For these people, they just wanted to be nice to the people that were on the island. For you guys, maybe there's someone in your life that just needs to feel kindness. You are a representation of Jesus Christ. Who are you kind? Do your neighbors know you as the kind neighbor? Or do they know you as the person that just cannot stand them and constantly complain about their children messing up your yard? It's a good question to ask yourself because we should be showing Jesus to everybody and we do it more than just showing up to church. We do it by the love that we show to others and oftentimes it's manifested in small acts of kindness. And so these people, they were just trying to be kind and look how it paid off. Let's look at verses three through six. So it says, Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and he laid them on the fire and a viper came out because of the heat and it fastened onto his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt, I love that, no doubt, for sure, this man is a murderer, whom though he's escaped the sea, justice does not allow him to live now. <laughs> but Paul shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that it would swell up and he would suddenly fall down dead. But after they looked and for a long time saw that there was no harm to him, they changed their minds and they said, yeah, he's a God. <laughs> what an interesting story, am I right? The natives dealing with Paul being bit is so much how humans react to something in our lives. Paul just went to go gather some sticks and I just, can I just say I love the heart of Paul. And there's something subtle in just gathering sticks that tells me a little bit more about his character. Keep in mind, he was on a boat with 276 people that are already condemned to death. There are people on there condemned to death and he's friends with the centurion. So he could have said, ooh, the fire's going out. Go send one of these people to go get sticks. Go send someone else to do this because this is above me. I teach the gospel. Instead, he chose to be the one that met the needs of the people. There was a need that needed to be done and so he went and he did. A servant's heart needs to carry on into all aspects, not just teaching and preaching. I'm telling you, I get so irritated by teachers and pastors that refuse to help out in any other way but teaching to you and preaching to you. No, oh, you want me to go on a hospital visit? I'm sorry, I'm a teacher. That's a pastor's job. Oh, I, I, I would like to go over. I would like to help. I would like to help with what you're doing. I would like to do it, but I am a pastor and I am a, I am a person of scholarly pursuits. You know, it's like, what is, your, what is your deal? You can't get your hands dirty? Listen, great leaders are people that would do and have done the same things they're asking you to do. Pastor Gerald has been in a, a shining example of that. There's nothing above Pastor Gerald that he doesn't do. He's cleaned toilets when they needed to be clean. He picks up trash when it needs to be picked up trash. When it's a work day, he's out there in his dirty clothes. And you know what happens from leadership down? If he's going to do it, we're all going to do it. Serving alongside others, not being elevated. And so Paul just went to go grab some sticks for the fire because he wanted to bless other people. And there was a snake in the sticks that didn't just bite him, didn't just bite him. You know, he was like, ah, did you see that snake? It went off. It was like, da, and he's like, ah, you know, it's just like hanging off, swinging its tail. And he's like, look at it, you know? 
As de- who has lived in this desert for more than 10 years? Raise your hand. You were all desert rats. You were all desert rats. I've been here for 14, so I'm along with you. I'm officially the person that moved here from Idaho, and I didn't know that you needed to rustle around your firewood or your sticks or whatever before you went grabbing it. Because here's what happens. There's snakes in them sticks, right? And you need to be aware that if there's a rattlesnake, you shake it up a little bit or you throw something there because you don't want to have, ah, you don't want that. And Paul got bitten by by the snake and the first thought of, you know, the first thought of all the natives, yeah, this man, he's done something bad. He's like a, he's like a murderer. Yeah, the, the reason he got bit and the reason he's going through hard times is he must be a pretty bad person. See, the Maltese believe that there's a universal law, that there was a moral law that always worked itself out. And so he survived the boat crash, but now that he's bitten by the snake, he's going to die because he's a murderer. You might go, that's a really weird way to think. Listen, it's the same exact thing in our culture today, even sometimes with believers. It's really, really weird how people do these kind of things. Oh, that person must have done something really bad to have this kind of problem happen within their life. You know, you'll look at someone suffering hard times or you'll look at someone who's homeless or you'll look at someone with financial turmoil or sickness and be like, there's times when people will draw this fact of like, oh man, alluding to the fact that, oh, they must have done something wrong within their life. I'm here to tell you, if you're suffering through hard times, it's not necessarily your fault. It's not, it's not the case all the time. Listen, in this world, nice things can happen to bad people, amen? And nice people can have bad things happen, amen? We as Christians have to stop blaming the universe and karma. There is no universe out to get you, nor is there a karma that's coming to get you. Please, I know I'm gonna be saying this with kind of like a weird, like, cocky attitude, but I'm not trying to. But what we do when we're saying that, oh, it's karma coming to get us, you know what you're doing? You're limiting the power of God to do the work. We leave it in God's hands and believe that he's a way better judge than us and he knows what he's doing in people's lives. I cringe when I hear Christians say, oh, I just know why these things are happening to me and you know why they're happening? Because I'm a Capricorn. Your astrology sign is bigger than the God that you serve? Oh, this is a wild month and I'm feeling a little bit rascally because you know me in March. (laughs) Are you serious? Did you see that guy? He just cut me off, gave me the bird. Karma's gonna get him. Stop, Stop talking about karma, it doesn't exist. Stop talking about your astrology signs. They don't exist either. You're mad at me? Be mad at God's word. Sure, there's consequences for living in certain lives. I'm not saying that. Like living a certain way in your life and having certain sin in your life will lead to consequences. That's obvious. Living in certain destructive lifestyles will leave your life in destruction. It's pretty, pretty uh, understanding, but it's not some universal karma that is punishing bad people. Because if we're just going upon universal karma, you know, punishing bad people. I hate to tell you guys something. Romans 3, 10 through 12 tells us that there is none, no, not one. There is not one who understands. There's not one who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They've all together become unprofitable. There is not one who does good. No, not one. You're all in a lot of trouble if karma exists is all I'm saying. It's not about, oh, I'm a better person than him. So that's not going to hurt me. Listen, in and of us, there is nothing good. There is nothing good, but Christ is perfect. Christ is what we want to show people, not you. Listen, in John John 9, 1 through 3, Jesus dealt with this exact way of thinking because his disciples were under the same belief that, oh, if something bad happens, then they had to have been a bad person. There was teachings of their day that was like that as well. They come up to Jesus and they said, Rabbi, who sinned? Was it this man or was it his parents that he was born blind. They're blaming his own sin or the people in his life's sin that he was born blind. And you know what Jesus answered that? He said, neither. Neither. Neither this man nor his parents have sinned. Now, we're all sinners, but they didn't sin to make this happen, is what he's saying. But that the works of God should be revealed in him. 
God has a plan even through your trial, even through your sickness, even through your troubles. That, 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 like it says, that the works of God should be revealed. This is why bad things can happen to us because God has a plan to reveal his good works. So they're thinking Paul was getting punished for some awful thing he did here. He gets this snake on his arm and he sh- shakes it off and throws it into the fire. And I can feel the temperature in the room right now, okay? I know that there's, we are, we are here in the desert and we believe in like, you know, all the animals were here before us or whatever everyone's talking about. And some of you right now are like, why didn't he relocate the snake, okay? <laughs> I'm here to tell you that in that day, there was no snake relocator at that time. So he couldn't call that awesome snake whisperer lady who absolutely, her job is the most terrifying thing in the world. She's like, look, it's a snake. I'm like, have fun with that, you know? And then they deliver it to your house and to your house out in the desert. They're like, no one lives here. You're like, I have a rattlesnake farm now, you know? <laughs> but there was no snake relocation, so he just shook it off, threw it in the fire. But look at the fact. He just calmly shook it off. He didn't freak out. How was he able to do this? I believe it goes back to Acts 27, 24 through 25. When the angel talked to him and said, do not be afraid, You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you and all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men. And then he says, for I believe God that it will be just as he has told me. He has a deadly viper bite him. He looks around, doesn't see Caesar. It's fine. I'm going to go see Caesar because I built my life on the promises of God. I built my life on something greater than how I feel or my terror level or being scared. Not even a deadly serpent is going to hurt me apart from what God is going to tell me to do. Notice too that this snake bite wasn't the breaking point of faith for someone like Paul. It wasn't like, ah, another thing, another thing in my life, Lord. You want to know why it wasn't a breaking point of faith? It's because he was walking in that will and the promise of the Lord. He didn't do something like we can so often do. He didn't go and curse and blame the people. If I wouldn't have had to go get the wood, I mean, I mean, you saw the fire. We all saw it burning out. You can send one of these 276 losers to go get it themselves. He didn't blame anybody. He didn't blame anybody. He didn't scream, why God? <laughs> Why? This is me talking. This, this is what I can do. Why, God? Why is this happening? Another thing. My life is so hard. Rather, he assessed the situation and he made like Taylor Swift and he shook it off. <laughs> Mark 16, 17 through 18 tells us, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, this doesn't mean that we act like complete crazy people in the South that take rattlesnakes, and they juggle them, and like tempt the Lord to bite them. I don't understand what they're doing, but that's not what this means. We're not gonna say, hey, we're gonna all drink poison and make sure that, you know, that we're living this out right. You know what this is telling us? It's telling us that through Christ, we are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. It is God who guides us. It is God who directs us. But you know what, guys? It's also God who protects us. You are in the care of the Lord. Do not worry about the things that can happen in your life. Jesus told us bunches of times to not worry about what's happening in your life. Keep your eyes focused on me. Listen, we have our own little Paul here at Joshua Springs. His name's Pastor Gerald. And he goes to more deadly, terrifying countries than any man has ever been to. And he's doing it in the later years of life. Listen, as much as he travels, I think I've already died thinking about how many places he's flown to. I'm like, if I was on a plane continually for 24 and 26 hours, you would have to come and get me in a few months because I'd be so jet lagged that I wouldn't want to see anybody. Yet God sustains Gerald. 
Gerald has been through some of the craziest things and eaten some of the craziest things because it was the culture of the day and God has protected him. He is doing more now for the Lord than he has done in his whole life. And it's because he believes that the Lord is directing him and if the Lord directs him, he's gonna give him the strength and protect him to do it. If the Lord calls you to do something, don't get wrapped up in the semantics of it all. Just trust in the Lord. And when the natives witnessed that he didn't get sick and that he didn't fall dead, because, you know, you know it's supposed to happen when you get bit by a terrifying snake, you know, one that's poisonous, one that has probably killed people in their village before, they begin to worship Paul as a god. Wait a second. The same person that they just perceived was a murderer, they're like, not a murderer, must be God. It's like, listen, if you were right, you wouldn't have been right. Do you understand that? If you were right about the first thing, you were wrong. And if you were right about the second thing, you were still wrong. Paul was neither a guilty prisoner, nor was Paul a God. But the way people perceived him had to be one or the other. This is a great example on why you can't get wrapped up into what people think about you. Because people's opinions constantly change, do they not? Whether they think good about you or whether they think bad about you, man's opinions are continually changing. It should not matter to you even a little bit. I've had people come and heap praises upon my messages. I love it. I'm like, thank you. It just says that God's using me. I'm, thank you, I appreciate it. But they're like, oh man, your message was great. Thank you for allowing the Holy Spirit to use you. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't get really wrapped up into it. Because at the end of the day, I realize it's not me. If you listen to anything good that I have to say, it's Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit ministering to you. Praise the Lord that he's using me. But also too, I've had people come up, the same people that were just like, your message was so great. I just loved it. And then the next week, I stopped going to that church because BJ told a joke that offended me. And now they're gone. I'm either a messenger of the Holy Spirit or I'm the reason they don't go to church anymore. And you're kind of sitting there like, how are those two things the same thing? I don't know, but I can't get wrapped up into either one of them because I just want to be faithful to what God has told me to speak. I want to be faithful to what God has told me to do. And oftentimes those same people that you spend time worrying about what they think about you are two ships passing in the night. People that used to hate me now love me. People that used to hate me, love me now hate me. Like there's, you know, who cares? Focus on the Lord. Don't worry about what people say about you. Don't, oh yes, yeah, so they said I was a great teacher, so I'm great. Now they don't like me. You know, don't worry about that stuff. Focus on what you're doing for the Lord and what he thinks about you. His decision never changes. His view of you never stops. He's not gonna go one day, oh, that's my son. That's my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then go, I never even knew that guy. If he knows you, he knows you. If your child is your child, you can't change the way he thinks about you. Let's see how Paul turns them around from thinking he's a God to showing people who the true God, true God is. Starting verse seven, it says, in that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us for cur courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed and he laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. They also honored us in many different ways. And when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. Think about this. What a refreshing time for Paul just to minister to others. All the drama that was in his life, all the accusations that had come against him, all the court hearings and the shipwrecks. You know what he was able to do? He's able just to go out there and to minister and to love on people that were there on the island. And you know what's even better than that? 276 people that were with him on a boat are now seeing him just ministering and the power of the Holy Spirit. And man, can you picture this man, Julius, this centurion soldier looking at Paul, healing a man? There's something to be said about just establishing your heart today to say, listen, I just wanna serve the Lord. Even if there's hard times, even if I feel like I'm stranded on an island, I'm just gonna serve the Lord. Because when you see people get excited for the Lord, it's an encouragement. When you teach children at Sunday school, it's an encouragement. When you're helping with the hospitality, mini, when, uh, the hospitality ministry, when people are struggling, it's an encouragement. Or you're serving the youth, or you're out on the field handing out a backpack to a kid in need. These are all therapeutic things to a believer. These are all things that Jesus would have you do. God first, then others. 
It's not you first, then God, then others. God first, then others. When your life becomes about serving yourself, when your life becomes about defending yourself and preserving yourself, your problems and stress are going to be elevated. If you're constantly worried about the state you're in, you're going to be in a big bunch of problems. But when your life is about serving others, it puts everything back into that right perspective. I quote this verse often, but I believe it with everything in my heart. When Jesus said in Mark 8, 34 through 35, he called the disciples and the people to himself and he said, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross. Let him follow me for whoever desires to save his life is going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Everything can be amiss in your life. And if you're serving the Lord, he gives you an, a peace that surpasses understanding. He gives you a joy. But when you're focused on yourself and preserving your life, it adds nothing but stress and anxiety. And this man, Publius, his father, he's suffering from some sort of fever and dysentery. And strangely enough, there's many that think that they know what disease it was. It was going around at the time called the Malta fever which, which, which plagued Malta and Gibraltar and some of these other islands that were around. And it was traced back to a microorganism that was in Maltese goats at the time. And we don't know how, how long this fever was on this man, but we know that the fever can last up to four months, but a lot of times too, it can take up to three years. So this man had a fever from anywhere from four months to three years. So who knows how long it took you know, while he was suffering in this state, but I'll tell you how long I know it took for sure. It took enough time for Paul to come and heal him. Do you guys understand again that even his shipwrecked self on an island is ministering to a man that could have said, Lord, if you're real, come and heal me. And here comes Paul, wetter than, you know, a rat inside of, you know, inside of a toilet, just dripping, like coming and going, you know what? God's told me to heal you and heals the man. And Paul healed him by a very interesting way. He went to him in faith, believing that God can do whatever. Church, whenever you pray, believe that, that what you say can and will happen. Don't limit the Lord. Don't pray these stupid, um, I don't wanna say stupid prayers. It sounds so mean. Don't pray these really dumb prayers. That didn't soften the blow there, did it? That limits God. Lord, I know you can heal him, but you probably won't, you know, just take him. It's like, until that person stops breathing, I'm going to pray the Lord heals him. And then he prayed for him and he laid hands on him. And you know what? The rest of it was in God's hands. Whatever God does at that point is up to him. Paul made himself available to be used by the Lord again and again and again. And the Lord used him again and again and again. Then notice too, the work and the power of the Lord, it began to spread. People then began to bring droves of people to be healed. Okay, you can do this to them. How about all these people? The gospel spreading over the island. People are beginning to follow the Lord. But you know what's interesting? Those two words for healed, the one that Paul did and the one where all the droves came and healed, those are two different words. Two different words. The word that Paul used for being healed when he healed Publius, his father, and the word for being healed for all the droves are two different words. The first one being for, for what happened inside that tent, Publius' father means to cure, to heal, to make whole. It's the same thing you see in miraculous healings. That was a miraculous healing church. What happened inside that tent was, was Paul laying hands, a miraculous healing. The man that had a fever for months and months and months, it left him and he was instantly healed. And people began to want that and they began to come. But the second word that was used that were healed, they were all healed. But the second word was Therapeuo, which is T-H-E-R-A-P-E-U-O, which means to serve, to do service, to receive medical attention. So all these other people began to come to him. And then you see, remember, Luke is with them the whole time. Luke is with Paul the whole time. So I don't think it's taking too much liberty to think that maybe at this point, who Luke is described in Colossians 4.14 as the beloved physician, began to give them practical steps to be healed began to give them remedies and medicines and things to help them. This could have been a God-given gift and talent of something that Luke had devoted his life to that God is now using for his kingdom. Luke could have been serving as a medical missionary in Malta for the masses. We don't know for sure, but we do know that those two words are different words. But one thing I do know for sure is God heals in many different ways. Amen? 
This next question I'm going to ask you, I would hope with everything inside of you, you could say the word yes, because it's 100% true. Can God heal in miraculous ways of healing? Yes. Man, I'm going I'm to do, yeah, see, we got some claps. We got like, this was loud. You guys were great here. Let's do one more time. Can God heal miraculous ways of healing? Yes. Okay. Can he also heal through doctors and surgeries and medicine? Absolutely. He can heal in any way he wants. And I'm here to tell you that God can heal in any way he wants. And I'm going to tell you that God will heal everyone in Jesus' name. And you're like, well, what about your dad? Was he healed in Jesus' name? What about my grandma? What about my friend? What about that person? Listen, I'm going to tell you that we will all be healed when we stand before him. When this body is done, when he is done with us, and he says, come home, we are all going to be healed. So he can heal miraculously. He can heal by doctors and surgeries, but he can heal by saying, your work is done, come home. New body, new creation, all pain has passed away, all former things are gone. So Paul and Luke are just kind of healing everybody. The gospel's being spread. I can only imagine what that's doing to these Romans. How can they choose not to believe now? They've seen the power of God on display. Verses 11 through 16, and after three months, we sailed an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers, which had witnessed to at the island. And landing at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. From there, we circled around to reach Rhygeum. And after one day, the south wind blew. And the next day, we went to Patuli. It says, there's a lot of people out there in Joshua Tree that likes patchouli. Um, and where we found brethren, we were invited to stay with them seven days. And so we went towards Rome. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Apley Forum and the three inns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and he took courage. Now, when he came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. You see him separated. People could see the work of God in him. There's no way he's going to be lumped in with everyone else. The work of God through him was enough to make all the guards go, wow, look at Jesus through this guy. Paul's on his way to Rome and we know that he had desired to talk to Rome. We're gonna talk about that again in a little bit. But if you look, man, the gospel's spreading all over Rome. The gospel is being spread everywhere and Paul's message is going out even though he's in chains and he had hope and he had faith that these people were, he was gonna be able to see them even in chains. And because of this journey he's on to go to Rome, you know, these people are beginning to gather to him and it's fulfilling that desire of his heart. They traveled either 33 or 43 miles just to get together, just like we are right now. They're getting together. They're praising the Lord for the work that was done. They're reading their word. They're, they're worshiping together. And Paul was so encouraged by the growth of the church. I want to tell you something. This is going to work in tandem. Paul was encouraged by the growth of the church, but as well, they were encouraged by Paul. This is how it works with the pastor and, and the congregation. There is nothing greater in my life than to see the church grow. And yes, I love that there's numbers in here and there's very few empty seats, but greater than that, I love that the church is growing. And their knowledge and the word of God, you're growing you're maturing. What a great thing that Joshua Springs is. And that's a huge blessing for me and Pastor Gerald to be able to preach and, and trust the Holy Spirit and to know that it's working. You guys are encouraged and we're encouraged to see the growth. It's working hand in hand the same way it was with Paul. He was so encouraged to see them and yet they were encouraged to see him. It's an amazing blessing what the Lord does. Verses 17 through 20. And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, men and brethren, though I've done nothing against our people or the customs of our father, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of these Romans, who, when they examined me, they wanted to let me go because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything of which I, to accuse my nation, for this reason, therefore, I have called to you to see you and to speak with you because for the hope of the Israel, 
I am now bound in this chain. So the first thing Paul does when he gets to, 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 to Rome is something he often did. He would, he would gather the church leaders and he would tell them that, hey, I'm gonna be sharing the gospel everywhere. But he did this this time to talk to them because he assumes that there's so many things that have been told about him because the reason he's in Rome. And so Paul wanted just to clear up some facts and he starts with this, with these, these Roman Jewish leaders. He said, listen, I have not forsaken Israel. I still consider you guys all family. You're my brother and you're here with me. And the second thing is, I don't know what's wrong with those people in Jerusalem, but I am innocent of all charges against the Jewish people. I have done nothing deserving of death. More importantly, Rome wanted to let me go because they know I'm innocent, but yet because they wanted to appease everybody else, they kept me in chains for over two years. Don't worry about me. I'm not gonna try to counter sue no one. I'm not gonna try to go against my brethren. I'm not going to go against them in that way, but I'm gonna tell you why I'm truthfully being imprisoned. It's because of the hope of Israel, the one who you don't believe in, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That's why I'm here. And he begins to tell them this. Look at how they reply back to him in 21 through 29. They said to him, we neither received any letters from Judea concerning you, nor has there any of the brethren who came reported or spoken anything about you. But we desire to hear from you and what you think for concerning this sect. We know that it is spoken against everywhere. So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him in his lodging, to him, and he explained and solemnly testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning until evening. And some were persuaded by the things in which were spoken, and there were others who disbelieved. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightfully through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, go to this people and say, hearing you will hear, and uh, uh, hearing you will hear, and you shall not understand. Seeing you will see, and you will not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have closed, lest they should see in their, uh, with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts in turn so that I may heal them. He's speaking directly to them and why they're fighting about this. And verse 28 says, therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will hear it. What an awesome statement that was made. For all the travels, through all the trials, through all the problems, all the things that he's going through, only to be answered. I mean, like he, he's talking to the Jews and he's telling them, this is why I'm here. I know you have questions. And they reply with, we don't know you. We don't know anything about you, nor has anyone from Jerusalem sent any sort of papers to accuse you. At some point, you're really excited because you're like, yeah, awesome. They're not even here to accuse me. This is gonna work out great for me. On the other end, you're like, what? See, there's a lot of reasons why people say that they don't understand why that, that he was there. I think the number one is, I think that they, they knew that their case was hopeless. And you stand before Caesar with a hopeless case, maybe that that punishment could come down on you for trying to cause problems. So they were like, yeah, we're just gonna send him away on a boat. We're never gonna write anything. We're never gonna go after him. We're never gonna do anything else. This just shows you how much these Jewish people hated Paul and wanted him out of Jerusalem. Let him get on a boat to go to Rome to, to deal with Caesar. They didn't care what happened. They weren't gonna show up. And the Jews in Rome may not have known who, the, jo, the Jews in Rome might not have known who he was, excuse me, but they were very curious about what he was following. They said, "There's a sect in which you follow of Judaism. That's how they called it. You followers of the way, you Christians, so they say. We've been hearing about you. And why is Christianity so unpopular with all the Jews? And what they did next was another appointment from the Lord. Paul desires to see all Jews come to see Jesus. And they're like, we want to know more about Jesus. Tell us what the gospel is all about. We're going to gather everyone we know. And Paul's like, I'll see you in the morning. You know, they show up and he preaches, guys, from morning until evening. I go over five minutes and you've gotten your purse and you're out the doors. Okay, morning until evening. He has taught once so long that someone fell out of the balcony and died. 
And now these people are showing up and tell us exactly why you follow Jesus. Oh, I got some words to tell y'all. I can point to you to Jesus, not only through my life, but through the word of God. I can tell you through the Old Testament why I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And I can tell you about my changed life, my testimony on why I believe Jesus is the Messiah. And he went on and on and on and on and on. Listen, this was never the way that Paul would have written his story or chosen for himself to minister the gospel. On his best day or worst day, he would never said, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be beaten. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna be stoned. I'm gonna go to court. I'm gonna get on a boat. That boat's gonna wreck. I'm gonna get stranded on an island. I'm gonna get bit by a snake. And then I'm gonna get, you know, it's like, he would have never written that story. But yet, now that you look at the end of the story, through shipwreck and trials and beatings, he's finally here. Even though I'm sure he would have hoped for an easier way, look at all the people that the Lord has used for him because what made Paul happy was serving the Lord. And so God began to put rich and poor people in his life. Influential and prominent men and no influence prisoners. Kings and governors, sailors and soldiers, Gentiles and the most religious Jews that anyone's ever seen. And God was truly working all things together for Paul's good the entire time. Today in our lives, God has never promised that you are going to be comfortable. I'm not here to lie to you and sell you some gospel that doesn't exist. Following Jesus is a dangerous road. It is not a comfortable road. I'm not here to tell you that following Jesus, financially you will be stable. I am here to preach Jesus that he is faithful to provide for you ministries and ministering opportunities and to do his work and to give you something called joy. Joy is not the same thing as happiness. Happiness, money can buy happiness. Money can't buy joy. Joy is not depicted by your circumstance. God gives you joy as you minister and serve to others that even in the midst of the storms and even in the midst of the trials and even in the midst of the mess of your life, God is walking through it with you, giving glory and working all things together for your good. And the question I want to pose to everybody in here, and you need to answer it within your own heart, not out loud. Is that where your heart wants to be? Because if your heart wants to preserve your name here, that's in direct opposition with making your name great in heaven. I want to have the best of everything this world has to offer. You're not going to get what you're looking for. The fulfilling thing of your life is serving the Lord. Listen, it's scary. It's a scary call to say, you know what? I want you over my own comfort. Lord, I want you to do with me with my time as you would have me do. Lord, I want you to do with my body as you would have it do. If me being sick leads one person to Christ, so be it. It's not a comfortable call, but it's a joyful call. It's a good, good call. And as Paul shared about Jesus, I find it so interesting. The same reaction that he had then is the same one that he had reactions over and over and over again, which is the same reaction that I'm giving to you now. The same reaction you're having right now. Whether you're the Jewish people that are listening to Paul speak about Jesus through the Old Testament or whether you're right here in this room today, some people are going to hear this message and they're gonna be persuaded. They can feel the Holy Spirit. You can feel the Lord saying, this is it. Wayward wanderer. Oh son, I've loved you at your darkest. Welcome home. Accept me. And you're gonna be persuaded and you're gonna give your life to Jesus. And then there's also those I know in every group that will hear this message and they will remain blind and they will remain deaf and they will choose not to believe. And every group when the gospel goes out, there's both groups of people. Who are you going to be in this room today? As we're closing this service and I'm going to give an opportunity at the end, think about who you want to follow and what you wanna be. Is it about your comfort here? Or is it about being sold out for the Lord? Look at verses 30 through 31 as we close where we leave Paul in the story. 
And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and they had a great dispute among themselves. Then Paul dwelt two years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. This is where the story ends. So what happens to Paul's life? What happens with Caesar? Where's the rest of the story? Well, there's good evidence to believe that Paul was released. There's good evidence to believe that the tradition tells us that most likely he went to Spain as he desired to preach the gospel. Paul himself expressed that I think that I'm going to be freed. I think that it's going to work out. I don't think he would do that unless he truly believed. But here's the truth about our lives as you serve the Lord that was the same with his life. Listen, there are seasons within our lives as there is in seasons of Paul's ministry. Throughout Acts and Paul's life, we've seen almost all of those seasons wrapped into one. We've seen really hard times. We've seen great times of breakthrough, now followed by him being in a rented house on house arrest for two years, just sharing the gospel. Not only was he sharing the gospel, but he was writing letters like Ephesians and Colossians and Philippians and Philemon, having Luke to come and hang out with him. We know that Luke hung out with him in this house. Young Timothy would come over. Let me raise you up, Timothy. I may be in this house for two years, but it's not gonna stop me doing from what the Lord's called me to do. Timothy's now in his house, being raised up as a leader to be the young pastor. He didn't have to worry about people trying to kill him. That's a plus. Why didn't they try to kill him? Because there's Roman guards out in front of the door who already respect him that listen to him preach the gospel every single day. And it's completely unhindered. Then to later on in life, most likely we believe he was released. He was able to resume his missionary travels like we know he loved doing. Then he was arrested again from two to five years later. Most believe then that he was condemned and then executed by, by Nero as a martyr. Between 64 and 67 AD, somewhere in there. But regardless how he felt of what season he was in, you guys know that the mission has never changed for Paul. Regardless of how he felt of the season that he was in, the mission never changed for Paul. The mission had always been to preach the kingdom of God, teach the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, and do it with all confidence. That's the way it ends. Preach the kingdom of God, teach the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. Listen, in our lives, God often doesn't show us the entire picture. For Paul's life, God didn't show him the entire picture. But man, looking at it through this, this, this life that he's living now, he's slowly putting more puzzle pieces. God gives you one puzzle piece at a time. And you don't even know what beautiful picture you're making, but by the time your life's done and your life is over, you will see the beautiful things that the Lord has done through your life. God is in the long game. God is doing the long game. He has plans for everyone, everywhere, and it concerns you. Let this be your motto. Let this be your focus in life, that you live, that you exist, that you breathe to preach the kingdom of God and to teach Christ with all confidence. Let that be your motto. Why you eat, sleep, breathe, live, survive to preach the kingdom of God, to teach Jesus Christ with all confidence. Why is there no end to this story? I don't understand. I believe that there's no end to this story for a couple reasons, but I'm gonna tell you one of them. I told you guys at the very beginning of this book, some of you guys in your Bible, it says the book of Acts. Others of you in your Bibles, it says the book of Acts by the apostles. And I always told you, it was not the book of the Acts by the apostles. It was the book of Acts by the apostles through the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that there's no conclusion to this book really because the book of Acts of the Apostles through the power of the Holy Spirit is still being written through his church today. I believe that the stories that are being written about are from your life and my life. I believe that God is still doing amazing things. I believe that healings are still happening. 
I know that people are turning to Christ for the first time and there's people coming and seeing and they're coming to see because you guys are going out and telling. Show people Jesus within your life. And listen, I'm gonna give everyone a chance to get your hearts right with the Lord tonight, this morning. I'm gonna give every single person a chance to get your heart right with the Lord and to know him for the first time. Because I, I, I shared with you, I know you're gonna be in two different spots and my goal is to teach the kingdom of God, preach Jesus Christ with all confidence and I'm preaching Jesus Christ with all confidence. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life and no man gets to the Father except through him. You cannot save yourself, stop trying. You cannot fix yourself, stop doing it. But you're on the spot now. You're on the spot. Your ears have heard, your eyes have seen. And I know that in this room, there will be those that reject the message and there'll be those that accept the message. And I'm gonna ask for every head to be bowed and every eye to be closed. I'm not gonna ask you to come forward, uh, but I am gonna ask you to stand for the Lord. If you want to accept Jesus Christ or get your heart right with the Lord, I would ask that you would stand right where you are so I may pray for you. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Listen, listen, you can't stand now. You won't be able to stand in the world. Trust me. Everyone here wants to see you come to know Jesus. One more chance before we start praying. If the Lord is pulling on your heart and saying, you have got to get right with me. Do not deny me anymore. Do not shut your ears to me. That is a call from the Lord and you will regret that decision of not standing right now, someday. If you want to accept the Lord, I'm gonna ask one more time that you would stand where you are at. If you wanna get your heart right with the Lord, that you would stand exactly where you're at. Amen. I'm just gonna pray for every person in this room and then I'm gonna ask you to repeat a prayer after me. And when I ask the prayer to be repeated after me, I'm gonna ask that everyone repeats that prayer. Amen? So let me pray for you guys first. Lord, I'm so thankful for the group that is standing. Lord, my eyes aren't closed, they are wide open. I'm looking at the people up top and the balcony that are standing. I'm looking at the people here that are standing and they're not standing before us. They're standing before you. And they're saying they wanna get their lives right. They're saying that they wanna accept you for the first time. They're saying that they, whatever reason they're standing, Lord God, that you would meet them where they're at. Lord, we know that you're faithful. We know that you drew them here. And Lord, we knew that you drew them even through your Holy Spirit to stand where they're at. And so Lord, you've done all the work. But Lord, now is the time that we wanna confess and we wanna believe in our hearts that you are the only way, that you are the only truth, that you are the only life. And so we're gonna do that as a church. We're gonna repeat this after them, repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I do believe that you are the Messiah and that you died on the cross and that you rose again in my place that I might live. Lord Jesus, fill me full of your Holy Spirit. Give me strength to follow after you all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless each and every one of you.